Thanks for, I'm glad to be here. I used to teach in a pool of light like this. I was a theater teacher and I'd make my students who were high schoolers come and stand in the center of a pool of light and uh, do nothing, which is uh, quite a challenge for them. I'm gonna talk about uh, learning games today and a little bit about Pearson. Um, uh, Pearson, many of you know Pearson, uh, but you may not know that we're mostly an education company. We consider ourselves a learning company. Uh, Penguin and the FT are a part of Pearson. Pearson's a London-based company. But our biggest part of our company is in North America for our North American education business. Uh, but you may know some of our education um, products, like here in the UK, Longman, Prentice Hall at Excel. Um, so we're, a test, we're not only a, a textbook company, but we're also a testing and a technology company. Um, about, actually, about a third of our revenues are digital revenues now. All of our Penguin books are published digitally. Um, FT.com is, uh, is, is published with the newspaper. And as our CEO, Marjorie Scardino, says, our values are defined by our purpose, which is to help people get on with their lives through education in the broadest sense of the word. So um, we are an education company. I want to talk a little bit about my journey. Do you remember these companies? Anyone here remember these companies? <laughs> Living Books and Mech, the Oregon Trail, and uh, Math Munchers and others. I worked at both of these companies before coming to Pearson. I was head of development um, at Living Books and also uh, at Mech. You may not know that the Oregon Trail was actually, is quite an old game. It was first produced on a mainframe uh, as a text-based game with a telephone coupler. And uh, MEC was a state agency in the state of Minnesota to do what we're talking about, to get technology into the classroom in those days. And Minnesota had Control Data Corporation and, uh, and other companies like that. After I, uh, after I worked at MEC, I came to uh, Pearson in 1997. So I've been there, I've been at Pearson for 14 years, mostly in learning and technology areas. And uh, I, for after I first came to uh, leverage textbook content with technology in 1997, I produced something called the No Zone, which really was one of the first online textbooks. It was a learning center that used all of the content from our, um, our elementary textbook at the time and put it online. It was a hybrid in 97. There wasn't much of an internet. It was a hybrid CD-ROM and internet. So all the data was passed along through the internet. And then uh, after that, I worked at a Family Education Network, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. And then I did a project uh, which resulted in what I'm showing you here, which was a textbook of the future project internal to Pearson. And the result was this history uh, social studies course in California. Uh, California does uh, calls for new textbooks. And in this case, we delivered a interactive uh, product. Uh, it was completely digital. Uh, there were three paths to teaching all of the standards uh, for California history social science. This is one of them. This is the print um, uh, path, which was also very interactive. Kids, e each of the kids got a book. They put their name in it. They wrote in their book. And it was much, it, it actually, the book learned from technology about how to be interactive. But there was a complete digital path, which was quite unique. And we took it was a big experiment around this textbook of the future, and it took less time, about half the time, about half the investment, and ultimately took about twice as much market share in California. Um, and so it was a big success. And so almost all of our, our programs in the US now have a digital path and are delivered digitally. And it's not just putting PDFs online, it's, it's uh, interactive. But I really want to talk about what I'm showing you here. I don't know if you've seen these portraits by Philip Tolendano uh, of gamers. And if you look at this picture, you can see you know, the wonder, the focus, the engagement uh, while this young man is playing a game. And uh, psychology professor Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who worked with Howard Gardner uh, during the time that Howard uh, Gardner was uh, developing the multiple intelligences, he called this state flow, which is a single-minded immersion. It's harnessing all your emotions for performance and learning. 
And this is something all of you are familiar with. You know when you sort of are so involved in something, you, put, you, know, you, forget, you lose track of time, and you've gotten so engaged, and four or five hours go by, and, and you lift your head up. I mean, everyone understands this. So I think flow is something that's really important in terms of games for learning. There are new games out there, as we all know. The ex explosion of social media has created a sort of a new platform for gaming, social gaming. And how many of you play Farmville? Admit it. <laughs> yeah, nobody. Uh, Farmville is, uh, is quite a phenomenon. And it, it's really, you know, uh, tr millions online trying to maintain their dignity with their friends. And it's very addicting. But it also has, you know, the same power to sort of engage. I mean, this is a site, farmvillestats.com, which really teaches you about you know, your yield, your crop yield, and how much money you're going to make, and, and you know, who's going to be ahead of someone else. There's lots of, uh, you're running your own farm business here. So I, I think that um, there are new opportunities. We talked about some of the other ones with Derek and others today. Pearson also, uh, I mentioned Family Education Network earlier. Family Education Network uh, in 2007 launched a site called Pop Tropica. Is this a site any of you are familiar with? If you have kids between 8 and 10, um, you, they might know Pop Tropica. There's been 320 million avatars created since, uh, since Pop, Pop Tropica started. It's a virtual world that um, allows kids to explore. And uh, it has a number of islands uh, it's a series of islands for kids to explore, each of them a game or a set of challenges or something new to discover. And some have more learning than others, like Mythology Island or Time Tangled Island. But as many as 10 million visitors, 10 million kids, are spending at least 25 minutes a session every month. It's a lot of kids. That, if you add it all up, it's like 4,000 hours, which is, would t take more than two years if you multiply 24 by 365 days, two years of time. It's played in 70 languages if, uh, based on how their browsers are set, the languages their browsers are set in, and um, in 100 countries around the world. And according to Google searches, Pop Tropica is the fifth most searched game, uh, just behind Black Ops and Halo Reach and Mass Effect 2. It, it's a bit of a phenomenon. And it's interesting that um, it's been an interesting um, experience for, for us at Pearson. This is a company, K0, who tracks virtual worlds registrations. And you'll see that uh, Pop Tropic has grown tremendously over the, over the years that it's been here. We now have about 137 million registered users. It, it's, it's just it's, it's astounding. I don't know if you've seen Pop Tropica, but I'll show you a little bit while I talk about how we created uh, Pop Tropica with this uh, movie. There is sound, but it's not important sound. So, um, there's a we had a, a site called FunBrain at Family Education uh, Network, which a lot of teachers used in the classroom. It was a simple site. It was sort of early on the web, uh, so it was used by teachers in the classroom. And again, thousands of kids came and used FunBrain during the school day because teachers were recommending it as a safe place for kids to play games online. Very, very simple games. So one of our challenges was to move that audience into the home market because Family Education Network was a consumer uh, site. Uh, there's a teacher site, Teacher Vision. There's a parent site, FamilyEducation.com and FunBrain. And we wanted to have kids be more engaged and find a new publishing platform for kids at home. And so we had to come up with something that we could move some of that fun brain traffic into the home market. We had a designer at, uh, at Fenn, who was the lead designer for kids, who came up with this concept for Pop Tropica. You may have heard of this guy. His name is Jeff Kinney. He's the author of Die Everyone Would Be a Kid. And uh, he is also sort of the brainchild behind Pop Tropica. He's sort of a sense of, of this age group. And, a Diary of a Wimpy Kid actually was first published on FunBrain as a diary, one day at a time. And kids, thousands of kids read Diary of a Wimpy Kid first online, and then later it was published as a book, and now there's 
the second movie in the works. So Jeff really had this vision for <clears throat> Pop Tropic, a very simple 2D uh, world where kids can explore. And it's proved to be uh, uh, quite popular. And there's new islands coming out every month. And it's, uh, it's a publishing platform that now includes uh, other authors like Big Nate. There's a Big Nate Island, and the, for Halloween we launched a Peanuts Island. And, and uh, next year Penguin's going to be publishing some Pop Tropica books. So it's starting to become kind of a transmedia experience where kids can um, explore and learn. <coughs> if, uh, one of the interesting things is if you do a search on Pop Tropica video on Google, which I did last night, you'll see that kids are making movies about their experience on Pop Tropica. So as we've been talking about today in the learning, the kids are actually sharing and becoming teachers and getting involved in sharing what they know and talking about what they're proud of, which I think is in a, a we've talked a lot about how important that is in the, in the learning process. And they want to show what they know. And so you'll see you know, cheat sites or walkthroughs that kids have made. In fact, last night there were 8,310 results for videos about Pop Tropica. And most of those were done by kids. Just a few of them uh, were done by us. These are my kids, um, Emily and Jake. But Emily on the left is 32, and Jake is 26. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is because these are, this is the generation right now. These are the teachers and the politicians that are coming in. And they're used to games. Look at the size of that mouse. That's in a Commodore Amiga computer, which we had at home. You can see the joystick on the right up in the corner. Um, my kids played games, I, I, partly because I was in the industry. But they, they learned playing games. And they're not afraid of games. And they don't see any issue about games and learning. They love the educational software games that we play. They, they, they talk about it even now with some nostalgia. And, and they, these are the kids who are in charge now. So I think that's an opportunity for us as we think about how to bring games into education. Even uh, our, our uh, retired US Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor um, is in the games business now. She's got a site called iCivics because she wanted to teach kids. She was disappointed that kids didn't know enough about civics. So she's got a website. And she has this great quote that says, if we can't, if a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. And that was sort of the impetus of, of her starting a game site. The biggest demographic shifts, you know, both David and um, uh, from Nintendo talked a little bit about this, but the, the shifts uh, are compelling um, in the game world. Um, women, according to the Education Software Association, represent a greater portion of the game playing public than 17 year old boys and younger. Um, and women are also the chief education officer at home usually. And so as these new devices and these networks that Sony and Nintendo and, and Microsoft are bringing into the home, you've got a new media hub in the living room. And, 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 and you've got a, a kind of a, a new types of software being developed that are, are very different than what we've had in, in some of the games. There's music, and there's dance, and, and there's fitness, and things like that. So why not education? I think you'll see that this is a trend that's going to be uh, pretty important. The average, uh, uh, there, 26% of gamers are over 50. Um, again, David talked about the use of the Wii in some uh, elder care homes. But 26% uh, you know, is a big number. And, uh, and many, many gamers play games together in person. And again, it's partly because of these uh, new devices from the big companies. This is a big market. The global video game market will grow from 51 billion to 73 billion. That's bigger than the movie and the music industry combined. And it's the fastest growing segment in the global media sector. There's a lot of technology being developed, much of which we've seen, that could be very powerful for learning. 
I think one of the ways that it happened in, when I was in the industry before, which the educational software industry sort of disappeared in the, in the mid-90s, um, it's really about mashups. It's taking great game designers, great artists, mashing it up with education, and neither of them compromising so that, that you can create something new. Hopefully better looking than this air-conditioned car, but uh, maybe not. Maybe it's just got to be messy and experimental a little bit. Um, so we're, I'm interested in mashups, and this role that I have at Pearson is across all of our businesses to really look at games and new technologies like augmented reality to understand what we might be, maybe should be doing differently and where we might do stuff. We, we, I've showed you a couple examples of things that we've done, but um, we don't really do that much. You know, our, some of our uh, digital programs certainly have games embedded in them, uh, learning games. We've got uh, new games on, uh, in the U.S. We've produced some games that go with our math textbook or our reading textbook that are delivered on the iPhone or the iPad. We've done some experiments with the state of Virginia on iPad education and things like that. Uh, but I think this concept for gaming is really trying to get the best from those of us who are educators and those of us who are game designers to find something that's innovative. For instance, um, I don't know, you probably know Katie Salen's work, and she's opened a school in New York called Quest to Learn, which is based on um, game, you know, game design and game theory. Um, this year, she, they're entering their second year. They had sixth graders last year, and now they have seventh graders. And they've broken up some of their languages different and based on sort of game structure, and they do a lot of collaboration. It's a great school. It's a public school in New York City. And eventually, it'll be a full sort of high school from 6 to 12 years old. It's a great example of sort of mashing some things together to create something new. But Penguin's doing stuff as well. We've, uh, uh, we've launched Spot on the iPad. We've also got Topsy and Tim, which are interactive uh, applications. And just yesterday in The Guardian, we announced that uh, Lady Bird now has uh, uh, the Baby Touch brand as a, uh, an iPad app for babies. And I think it's important to experiment and, and to try these things. And, and so our editors are doing that kind of thing on the consumer side. We're doing it on the education side. Um, I haven't convinced the FT to, to get into it completely yet, but there's a new book called News Games by Ian Bogost, which is all about playing games uh, in journalism. And so, um, I, you know, I think there's lots of potential. It's not very hard to imagine how playing and learning work at this age, because that's how kids learn. It's a natural process. And I think it's something for us to remember and to apply as we, as we work together to improve learning for all ages. Thank you very much. Yeah. One and a half minutes. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Um, and so it's a particularly interesting presentation to me in that you have this emphasis on the universality of gaming and, and the fact that in, in one sense it's not magical or new. It can be very, very straightforward. It can just be an extension of being interested in people. Um, now, I, I don't want to cut into our following speakers' times, so I might just ask you personally quickly if there's, if there's any games you in particular love, if there's something you, you look at in the, in the world of games that, that excites you at the moment in, in, in the terms you've been talking about? Well, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm mostly astounded by sort of the storytelling that I've seen in games. I had to, of course, go out and invest in uh, the latest equipment. I've been away from the games industry for a while, so I got all the new platforms, a new Xbox, a new PS3 and all that, and started buying games. And, and just the technology is astounding, um, like Heavy Rain, which is, not a great game for kids, it's a, but it's a psychological thriller and there's a story behind it. So I'm, I'm intrigued by sort of the storytelling because I think storytelling is an important part of learning and how that's being done, this interactive kind of storytelling environment. 